Hello and welcome to our London History Podcast, where we share our love of London, its people, places and history in weekly 20-minute episodes. I am your host, Hazel Baker, qualified London tour guide and CEO of London Guided Walks. You can follow us on Twitter at guided underscore walks or find us on Instagram at walk underscore London or indeed we're also on Facebook on London Guided Walks. We offer lots of lovely guided walks and private tours, treasure hunts and virtual tours for Londoners and visitors alike. You can check those out on our website londonguidedwalks.co.uk. Don't forget, our blog is regularly updated with posts written by our passionate team of qualified tour guides, and there are hundreds to choose from, all absolutely free. Bridgerton is the latest Netflix original series produced by Grey's Anatomy Shonda Rhimes. This period drama is based on Julia Quinn's novels set in Regency London. Even if you haven't read the books or even like the idea of a love child of Nanny McPhee and a wedding decorator, the true stars of the series are the buildings themselves. So I thought I'd share with you a little bit of Regency London history from the places mentioned in Bridgerton, either in the books or the latest TV series. Don't worry, you don't have to be familiar with any of the work at all. Just sit back and let me take you back to Regency London. It must have been an exciting time for the aristocratic Ton, who would venture to London from their country seats for what was known as the season. And in Bridgerton, we have the two main families, the Featheringtons and also the Bridgertons, both coming to London and having resided in Grosvenor Square, Mayfair. Grosvenor Square is very different now compared to during what it was like in the Regency, especially 1813 when the books are set. Um, Grosvenor Square covers about two and a half hectares and was originally constructed by Sir Richard Grosvenor in the early 18th century. And this was supposed to be a private square, um, but by the end of the 18th century had become a public space. And the first garden on the site was laid out by William Kent around 1725 and then it was simplified in the early 19th century. Architectural names such as John Soane, John Adams, Geoffrey Wyatt and then who becomes Geoffrey Wyattville and also Samuel Wyatt all have a go at reshaping the face of Grosvenor Square. But in 1813, the houses were no more than three storeys high and also a little bit less in your face than the ones that we can see now. And that's why when you have a look at the Bridgerton's house, you might notice that you recognise it. It is in fact the gorgeous Ranger's house in Greenwich. And I'll share a photo of Ranger's house in the show notes. But it's a beautiful um, Georgian house uh, on the edge of Greenwich Park. Some say a Blackheath. Uh, And um, ivy and wisteria have been added to the front to add a dewy sort of romanticism for the TV series. The house itself was built in 1723 and later became the residence for the Rangers of Greenwich Park and it remained home to aristocrats, royals, uh, all the way until 1902. And we actually have two blog posts that you might enjoy on that score. One about Queen Caroline, who married the Prince Regent, and also one about the Queen's house in Greenwich Park, which quite nicely links to the second part of filming for Bridgerton. And the Queen's House is used on two different occasions, actually. One, when a new wing of Somerset House is opened, um, and so they use the front of the Queen's House for that. And then they also use the underside of Queen's House. And this is when uh, the Duke of Hastings beats up Lord Burbrook. um, And that's underneath the arches in between the Queen's House, which quite fantastically used to be a public road. What brought all these society families into London at the same time? Well, it was the season, of course. And the season was a way of, let's just say, bringing the right sort of people together. And it was an endless whirlwind of festivities and parties with pleasures and excesses, all whilst providing the perfect setting for the largest marriage market in the world. 
And this is where young women would come out as if being released into a fashionable society during which was called this season. And generally speaking, this was when young girls at the age of about 18 uh, and therefore prime marriageable age. Coming out wasn't for every family. Don't forget, if you think of the Bennett sisters in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, all five daughters are out at the same time and none of them were presented at court. And so that's got to do with money and the level of the circle that they're in there. And incidentally, Miss Anne de Berg, Lady Catherine de Berg's daughter, hasn't been presented at court either. But this time it was due to her ill health. And don't forget, Miss Anne de Berg had already been sort of promised to Mr Darcy, even though we know he has other ideas. A really tough question to answer is, when was the season? because there are naturally no set dates as to when the season happened. The season fell between two rules, one the general rule and the other one the actual practical one. So the season is linked generally to correlate with the parliamentary season. Logic states that when people are in town for parliamentary sessions, then dinners and balls will be planned to a scale that suited the expected influx of the bon ton. The actual dates that the King opened and closed Parliament each year are available from Hansard. 1810 to 1811 was the year with no Christmas, when members of Parliament were in ad hoc meetings over the King's illness. And those meetings were going on well into December. But in 1813, when Bridgerton is first set, this is when Parliament opened in reality in late November. Sports and holidays also had to be considered as well. The hunting season, for example, for grouse started in August and that's when the aristocracy were usually in their country estates for the summer. Fox hunting season was from about November through to March, which may have contributed to the main London season during the Regency period being delayed until after Easter. So we see evidence of ladies being presented at court on two dates before Easter and two dates after. And the proper kickoff to the season might have actually delayed them coming out until then. And you might hear the term debutantes um, as being presented at court, but this was a term that was used a lot later. They were called, they certainly spent a huge amount of money on their future. A dress for coming out, for example, could have cost up to £500 of their money. And that's before you go on to add other expenses such as the carriage or the jewels and the lace. My goodness, the lace! And also the balls in themselves. So you add all of that up and it's going to cost an absolute fortune. And so it's only the wealthy that could um, throw the balls, attend the balls, um, in this season. And saying all that though, the height of the London season fell between early May and the end of July. In the first episode of Bridgerton, the first couple of seconds actually gives you a bird's eye view of Regency London. And the first thing you'll see is this expansive green, which is Hyde Park. But they didn't film in Hyde Park, they filmed in the exquisite grounds of Wilton House. The land of Hyde Park originally belonged to Westminster Abbey and then was acquired by Henry VIII during the Reformation. And that's where he enclosed the land, stocked it with deer to form yet another of his private hunting grounds. In 1689, William III and Mary II bought Kensington Palace, which is on the far side of Hyde Park to the west, and they made that their London residence, and the king created a direct route directly through Hyde Park to this new palace and lit it all the way with 300 oil lamps. That must have looked amazing. And this originally was known as the King's Road, and it was the very first artificially lit roadway in the whole of England. During the reign of George II, Hyde Park changed dramatically. Some 200 acres of the original 395 were added to Kensington Gardens and Queen Caroline employed Charles Bridgman to help redesign the two parks. Bridgman dammed the Westbourne River and formed the Serpentine and that leads us all the way up to the Regency era. Bridgerton starts in 1813 and that is exactly when the Picture of London writes this about Hyde Park. One of the most delightful scenes belonging to this great metropolis and that which most displays its opulence and splendours 
is formed by the company in Hyde Park and Kensington Gardens in fine weather, chiefly on Sundays, from February till June. Spacious gravel roads within the park are, on a fine Sunday, covered with horsemen and carriages, from two till five o'clock in the afternoon. A broad footpath that runs from High Park Corner to Kensington Gardens is frequently so crowded during the same hours with well-dressed people passing to or returning from the gardens that it is difficult to proceed. A noble walk stretching from north and south in Kensington Gardens at the eastern boundary with its gay company completes this interesting scene. Numbers of people of fashion mingled with a great multitude of well-dressed persons of various ranks crowd the walk for many hours together. Before the stranger enters Kensington Gardens, we recommend him to pause on some spot in Hyde Park, from which his eye can command the entire picture of carriages, horsemen and foot passengers in the park, all eager to push forward in various directions. And... On the more composed scene of the company sauntering in the gardens. Such a spot will present itself to the intentive observer more than once as he walks through the park. But perhaps the best situation for this purpose is the broad walk at the foot of the basin, as it may be called, of the river, where it falls into a narrower channel. It has been computed that 50,000 people have been seen taking the air at one time in Hyde Park and the gardens. Nor is this a modern practice, for this spot has been equally resorted to for 200 years past. Remember the King's Road I mentioned about being lit by 300 oil lamps during the reign of William and Mary? Well, its name changed to King's Old Road and then Lumpy Road and then became known as Rotten Row. That's most probably from a corruption of the French uh, for King's Road, Rue de Roi, but we can't know for certain. What we do know is that Rotten Row was a fashionable place to ride your horse in London. And this famous stretch of road in Hyde Park was notorious for speed demons on horseback. In the prologue to his 1799 play Pizarro, Richard Brinsley Sheridan wrote... Horsed in Cheapside, scarce yet the gayer spark achieves the Sunday triumph of the park. Scarce yet to see him, dreading to be late. Scour the new road and dash through Grosvenor's gate, anxious yet timorous too, his steed to show the hack Bucephalus of Rotten Row. It must have been absolutely exhausting spending several hours on display for the world, or well, at least for society to see. And you were able to get refreshments as well from the Keeper's Lodge. And it's sometimes called the Cake House. And that was built in 1637 on the north side of the Serpentine. And it was where you bought refreshments such as a nice glass of milk or uh, a syllabub or also cheesecakes. And the lodge survived all the way until it was demolished in 1826. Hyde Park was also used for military reviews and it's a list of amusements in for March in the Picture of London 1813 wrote Towards the end of this month and during most of the spring and summer are to be seen reviews and other military spectacles in Hyde Park generally two or three mornings in the week. Notice of these may be had at the offices of the Commander-in-Chief or of the Adjutant-General at the Horse Guards, Whitehall. Other military-themed events that happened in Hyde Park during the Regency period include a mock naval battle, and that was staged actually on the Serpentine, depicting the British defeat of the French, which ended with the French fleet being set on fire. This was followed by a firework display and water rockets. And then there was a grand fair which lasted all week. And these were all part of the festivities and rejoicing that took place in Hyde Park at the consequences of the peace in 1814 and the visit of the Allied sovereigns. Mr Sarvis Reddings describes with the pen of an eyewitness the review of the Scots Greys in Hyde Park in the presence of the Majesties. It was amusing 
to see the activity of the other princes and of the Duke of Wellington in their movements, and the incapacity of the Prince Regent to keep up with them. Already grown, unwieldy and bloated, he was generally left behind in the royal excursions, being too bulky and too Falstaff-like to move about as they did. Decimus Burton gave Hyde Park a makeover in the 1820s, and it hasn't really changed very much since then. The end of the Regency officially ended with the coronation of George IV. The Prince Regent has now been promoted to King. And this was on the 19th of July, 1821. In Hyde Park, there was a regatta and boat race on the Serpentine, followed by illuminations by coloured lamps and Chinese lanterns and a huge firework display. Duelling was illegal, and it had been from the early 1700s. And Hyde Park was one of the most popular venues in the 18th century for settling affairs of honour, as they were described. And you might remember that in Poldark, Ross Poldark had duelled with Monk Adderley in Hyde Park in the autumn. And that was the late 18th century. And now in 1813, we have a duel in Bridgerton against the Earl of Hastings and Daphne's oldest brother, the rake, Anthony Bridgerton. In the Romance of Duelling in All Times and Countries in 1868, Andrew Steinman writes about Hyde Park like this. The park was notorious as a place where footpads crowd and where duels took place without much danger of observation or interference. And in both Poldark and Bridgerton, we see pistols being used in the duels, and this was quite common from the late 18th century in England, and pistols and duelling fences uh, continued to coexist throughout the 19th century, and these duels were holding up based on codes of honour, really. Um, they were not for so much to kill the opponent, but to gain, and I quote, satisfaction, and that's to restore one's honour by demonstrating a willingness to risk one's life for it. Duelling had originally been reserved for male members of nobility, but then it kind of moved to the upper classes by the time what we're talking about. And indeed, the mania for duelling had all but died out. It was in its main height, I suppose, during the reigns of Charles I and James II, and that's because gentlemen wore their swords in everyday life. We also see the Queen's residence, the external bit of it is being St. James's in CGI, but is actually Hampton Court uh, Palace's courtyard um, in the filming. And then the interior of the Queen's residence is um, a Lancaster house in St. James's and also Wilton House near Salisbury, which is also the Grand Hall and dining room for Lady Danbury's house. And also it's used for the external Hastings um, house as well. Other London locations include Scion House, Bedfordshire, which is the London home for the Duke of Northumberland. Windsor Great Park is also used for scenes in Battersea Fields and Rotten Row. Interestingly, the Hackney Empire served as the interior of the Opera House. So there's quite a bit of London that you can see in Bridgerton, if you know where to look. Hopefully that's given you a taste of Regency London. I know I haven't included the pleasure gardens or theatres or those fabulous, fabulous balls, but there's only so much I can squeeze into 20 minutes. Plus, it gives us something to talk about next time. And the latest stats show that we are now number 18 in the list of travel podcasts in the UK. Don't forget to share this podcast with your friends and family who you think might find this interesting. And if you haven't left a review, then please, please do. That's all for now, though. I'll see you next week.